Hello internet, welcome to another video about fan theories. Ever since I made the first fan theory video, I really wanted to do a follow up on it because despite that video taking like 12 years to make, I still feel like I somehow didn't cover enough ground in it. Which is thanks in part to the fact that I picked such a broad topic to talk about. To make it a bit different from last time though, I thought I'd make this one more video game oriented since I tried to avoid them for the most part last time. The reason being that I wanted to thank MatPat for making googling video game theory absolutely fucking impossible. And while I'm here, I thought I might take the time to correct a bit of a goof from the last video since apparently I can't read. Vader means father in Dutch, not German, which was actually corrected in the original post had I just scrolled down to the comments, so that's on me. This is why we use Google Translate, everybody. And with that embarrassment behind me, we can move on to some new ones. I thought it'd make sense to start off with coma theories again, but to be honest, I think I covered all my bases last time. There really aren't that many left that aren't just the same thing over and over again. However, I did find a not so bad one that suggests that all of these civilization games take place in a sort of afterlife, which explains how you can play as so many long dead world leaders from across history all at the same time. And honestly, for an it was all a dream theory, I don't hate this one. Sometimes though, a coma theory becomes so powerful that it turns into the actual storyline of the game. I cut this one out of the last video because I didn't really think it fit, but now that I've had more time to think about it, I feel I should probably talk about the sequel to one of my favorite games of all time, Drawn to Life, the next chapter. At the ending of the game in the end credits, you find out that the entire thing has just been the dream of a kid who finally woke up from a coma following a car accident that killed both of his parents. Yes, this game is rated E for everyone, I don't know either. Unlike the original, I never actually finished Drawn to Life 2, so it could be that this ending is more satisfying in context. And I did read that there are a number of hints throughout the game building up to this, rather than it just coming out of nowhere. And an ending like this even changes the motivation of the villain Wilfrey, who as it turns out was actually just trying to save everyone from disappearing once the kid woke up. Luckily though, there's a new game in the series that released I think last year that I still haven't played for some reason, and its existence is making me think that they may have thankfully retconned this. Anyway, with the more boring stuff out of the way, let's have a look at some more cross over theories. Here's one spurred on by the developers themselves, the idea that The Last of Us is in some way a sequel to the Uncharted series, thanks to some shared easter eggs and references across both series, most notably this bar that features in both Uncharted 3 and The First Last of Us. Also in Uncharted 3, after the bar fight at the beginning of the game, you can find a newspaper referring to a mysterious fungus being studied by scientists, which I'm sure isn't anything to worry about. And if this is the case, then I choose to believe Nathan survives somehow because it is far too depressing otherwise. Or maybe even Uncharted takes place in an alternate universe where the fungus did appear, but then everything just carried on as normal, and so gamers were a lot less angry in 2020. And now, the Game of the Year award goes to... And I'm thinking this might be the case, because if you look at the timeline, Uncharted 4 takes place in 2015, with the epilogue of the game being the much later 2028, whereas in The Last of Us, the outbreak scene at the beginning of the game is set in 2013. All right, we're good. <sighs> I feel better. In the exact same respect, there's the idea that Fallout and Skyrim are in the same timeline, all because of a plant in Fallout 4 that takes on the same appearance as one in Skyrim. Or it's just very clearly Bethesda reusing an asset, but that's not very interesting, is it? There have been ideas that the considerably different Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls are connected, which is all but canon at this point, thanks in part to a number of easter eggs thrown in by the show creators. Grunkle Stan's third journal appears in an episode of Rick and Morty, and then to get even more on the nose, two Mortys then appear cosplaying as Mabel and Dipper. Bill Cipher also makes a few cameos across Rick and Morty, which is probably not a good sign. On the flip side, Gravity Falls returns the favor, mostly in book form, with their release of the aforementioned Journal 3 containing a wealth of references to Rick and Morty, most likely because Disney wasn't paying as much attention. Then there's the most concrete evidence, where in an episode of Gravity Falls, Stan accidentally sends a few items through a portal, items that then fall out of another portal in a Rick and Morty episode aired prior, which is awesome. Referring again to the Pixar theory we mentioned last time, one of the more interesting connections between the films is the gradual progression of the by and large company. Obviously they're best known for being the ones to completely fuck over humanity and Wally, -E, but prior to that we can see their slow attainment of power in other Pixar films where they started out as a mere battery company in Toy Story, then progressed to vending machines and other Toy Story shorts, and then apparently became important enough to be able to promote themselves at the Piston Cup in Cars 3, and then from there I suppose took over the entire world. Now I'm not an expert, but I'm pretty sure that's exactly exactly what happened with Amazon. There are even crossover theories that link together stories of the same franchise, like for example the idea that the Evangelion rebuild movies are in fact a sequel to the original show, which while not outright stated, can be implied with some subtle hints, like the fact that the sea is still red in the rebuilds as seen in the ending bit of the end of Ava, as well as some other minor clues, possibly hinting that all of this is just the world that Shinji recreated. Which explains why Asuka is in it a lot less, all things considered. As I'm recording this, I'm yet to see the newly released 3.0 plus 1.0, so maybe there's some more hints in that one or maybe it debunks this entirely. I don't know, please don't spoil it. <laughs> 
Moving on to headcanons now, one of the most prevalent in the gaming community is the idea that Shepard from Mass Effect was indoctrinated by the Reapers at the end of the third game. Now, I've never actually played these games, so none of those words mean anything to me at all, but it's so popular I thought I had to bring it up. At the end of Mass Effect 3, spoilers, spoiling this for myself as well, by the way, don't worry, you're given three choices in regards to what to do with the Reapers, and the one that you think would be the good choice is marked as red. The theory goes that these final moments are, in fact, part of the dream state where Shepard's free will is being corrupted, which is why all of these choices essentially amount to the exact same thing. This one has been used as a coping mechanism to justify the ending of a game that everybody hates with a seething passion, and I can totally understand why a game all about decision making, concluding with three unrelated options, regardless of the choices you've previously made, would be a bit annoying. I don't think we ever needed an explanation for how exactly Smash Bros works, but a lot of people seem to overlook that the answer is blatantly shown to us in the opening of the original Smash Bros on the Nintendo 64, which within like the first 10 seconds shows us they're all just toys, brought to life by some random child's imagination. A child who may have some unresolved issues. This is also what I assume Master Hand is meant to be representative of, since he's effectively the puppet master of the whole thing. Why exactly you then proceed to beat the shit out of said creator is beyond me, but make of that what you will. I also choose to believe that the subspace emissary is just one big adventure they came up with, and the reason why characters like Sonic show up so late into the game is because he only just bought them. I also remember reading a theory a while back that Taboo, the final boss of Brawl Story Mode, was meant to represent him going through puberty or something? I don't know, that sounds about right. Another fairly prevalent one in the gaming community is the idea that Majora's Mask is representative of the five stages of grief, with Link probably being dead the whole time. I would talk about how Majora's Mask is one of the darkest in the Zelda franchise and how the game feels a bit off in comparison to the others, but that's about as overdone as saying that Sonic games had a bit of difficulty transitioning into 3D. This one's pretty in-depth compared to some of the others, so I thought I'd just give a basic outline to avoid taking up the entire video. As far as we know, Majora's Mask takes place a few months months after the events of Ocarina of Time, since the ending of that game sees Link returning to the past as a kid again. The plot of the game essentially revolves around Link ending up in the realm of Termina, which is supposed to be like a parallel version of Hyrule. And some people have gone and linked these events with the five stages. You get denial from the residents of Clock Town, who serve as Termina's equivalent of climate deniers, who are in complete disbelief of their horrific impending doom and intend to do absolutely nothing about it. The Deku King got pretty mad at a monkey for no reason, so that's anger. In the Snowhead section of the game, the ghost of a Goron pleads with Link to return him to life, which is our bargaining. Great Bay has the Zoran Lulu falling into a depression as a result of being a character in Majora's Mask, and then finally the end of the game is quite obviously acceptance, with Link moving on and leaving the events of the game behind him or something. The Link being dead theory meanwhile is kicked off at the beginning of the game where Link falls off a pona, with Termina simply serving as a purgatory for him to come to terms with his own death and god damn it this is another coma theory. This is not the only interesting religious theory I came across however, as I actually read that the boss baby is meant to be an allegory for the events of the bible, as indicated by <laughs> Bringing back some more edgelord theories, there's of course the idea that Animal Crossing is more sinister than it seems, and is actually a site for abducting humans and making them slaves or something, all because the bus driver that brings you there in the first place is a Kappa, a fictional Japanese creature that's whole deal is basically kidnapping people. Then, oh god, in Batman Arkham City you can find this crib made by Harley Quinn at one point in the game, which on its own would be weird, but you can also find several pregnancy tests on the floor of the same office in the game's DLC. Jesus Christ, can one of these be about like someone finding a cure for cancer or something, my god. In Bloodborne, one of my favorite oh, why, games why, ever made, why? you heal your character's health by drinking vials of blood, the source of which is never explicitly stated unfortunately. However, all of these vials are only given to you by female NPCs, one of whom stops giving them to you when she becomes diagnosed with the tragic, uncurable illness of being pregnant. You also can't get any of these from elderly female characters. So, you may be drinking men- In Shadow of the Colossus, it's never explicitly stated what the relationship between the protagonist Wanda and Mono is, the girl you spend the entire game trying to revive, and even when you do, it's pretty clear she doesn't even recognize Agro, the horse you spend the entire game with that Wanda is quite obviously a bit fond of. So if she doesn't even recognize her, then it really begs the question of how exactly the two even know each other. They could be childhood friends, or maybe Wanda doesn't even know her that well and just wants to help, or maybe he just really fucking hates Colossi and wanted an excuse to murder a shit ton of them. And going back to crossover theories, there's even one that ties this game into Team Eco's previous game, uh, Eco, because Shadow of the Colossus's ending reveals a horned baby that bears a resemblance to the protagonist in Eco, suggesting that Colossus might even be a prequel. What's hilarious is that even the game's creators don't really know how the two connect, so any theory is a really fair game here. Another endless debate comes from Transformers the movie, with the long-standing question being whether it was Skywarp or Bombshell that became Cyclonus, since the scene where we see him being reformatted unfortunately shows two Cyclonuses for some fucking reason, and Hasbro has since adamantly refused to tell us at every given opportunity. It does make more sense that 
that it was Bombshell since his whole thing was making clones of himself and that's also what Cyclonus can do. The original storyboard even clearly shows Bombshell, as well as the fact that just the framing of the shot makes it pretty clear unless a brand new character reveal is going to be that guy in the corner over there, but that sure doesn't mean anyone's going to stop arguing about it anytime soon. There's a pretty well-known theory from YouTube channel The Sega Scourge that theorizes that Metal Sonic is actually a roboticized Sonic from an alternate future, which explains how he's so efficiently able to keep up with his adversary. Which kind of makes sense considering that if Eggman is capable of making something like Metal in the first place, then why wouldn't he just do that with all his other bad mix. It also kind of fits together with Sonic CD's overall theme of time travel, considering that's the game he debuted in the first place. I somehow never heard of this one before, despite Metal Sonic being like my favorite Sonic character ever. And I gotta say, I really love this one, even if it's probably not true. His video goes a lot more into detail about why he would eventually become the villain and Sonic Heroes and all that, but I don't want to spoil too much because his video explains it far better than I ever could. We're gonna spend a lot of time on this next one because there is just so much ground to cover with it. A long-standing and very popular theory admits the Mega Man fanbase that bridges the gap between the original Mega Man games and the future series Mega Man X that I really love because I'm a little edgy at heart. Explains that Zero, one of the major characters from Mega Man X, was actually responsible for killing the original Mega Man, as well as Dr. Light and Bass and probably every other member of the main cast as well. There's a cutscene in Mega Man X4 where Zero flashes back to some past event where he sees Wily telling him to basically go fucking kill Dr. Light, and then several scenes after show a bunch of dead robots and actual literal blood on his hands. The games tell us that Zero was made by Dr. Wily, but was too hard to control and so had to be sealed away. So some seem to think that during this period where he was free, he succeeded in finally achieving Wily's longtime goal of defeating Mega Man, and then kind of went a bit overboard and murdered everyone else to death as well. Which does explain why they're never seen in any X game, despite it being confirmed that the X series is a direct sequel. This was refuted outright by the series producer in a 2004 interview though, maybe because the idea of one of his new heroes being responsible for the deaths of all of his old ones maybe didn't sit too well with him. It's never been properly explained as far as I know as a casual fan of the series, so take everything I say with a grain of salt, please. What exactly happened between the events of Mega Man and X, or even how the original Mega Man died? Since it's been stated that he and X are not the same robot, despite what I've thought my entire life, what we do know is that Zero was created during the period where the original Mega Man was still around, thanks to an ending in the spin-off game Mega Man The Power Battles, so I suppose it's not impossible. But other people have argued that Zero didn't activate until X was around, while others have said that X was made specifically to counter Zero. Mega Man timeline stuff gets really confusing, so I'm not at all gonna pretend to be an expert on this. There's been a lot of discussion about this, and no one can really seem to agree on anything at all, so all I can tell you is the idea is not a concrete answer. It would also make sense that if Wily had created Zero, he wouldn't really need base around anymore. So, just for reference, I can't even beat the second boss of Mega Man X, but man do I find this shit interesting. And this all really begs the question of why Mega Man X was even created in the first place. Maybe Rock simply went back to being a servant for Dr. Light and X was made as his replacement just in case. Or maybe Light survived Zero's rampage and made X as a last resort. In the Game Boy Mega Man 2, you encounter Quint, who is actually Mega Man from the future who has been modified by Dr. Wily. Hey, wait a minute. And he was able to do this because by that point in the future they had achieved world peace or something, and so Mega Man being a super fighting robot was no longer required, so he was able to revert back to being a household robot. So maybe that's just what happened. Again, not a Mega Man expert, I'm sure there are people who can disprove everything I've just said, but I really like this one a lot. And with that, I never want to hear anything about Mega Man ever again. Moving on. And to round things off, one thing people wanted me to mention last time were times where fan theories have actually been right, which I totally forgot about, so here we are doing just that. And while we're here, I've got another mistake to correct. I kind of forgot to mention last time that that whole thing about the hero shade being the hero of time was actually confirmed in the Hyrule Historia, so thank you to everyone and their grandma for letting me know about that one. Onto ones I didn't screw up. A classic one that we all know was confirmed ages ago was the idea that Mario 3 was actually just a stage play, evidenced by the whole vibe of the game, what with the curtains and the strings holding up platforms and each level even sees you running off the stage. This all kind of has some weird connotations for every other Mario game though, especially ones like 64 with the Lakidu camera that follows you around everywhere. Plus Sunshine has all of its levels entitled as episodes and then Mario Party is a game show? How, how much of it is real? I kind of hope this one is true when it comes to our next one though, which implies that in Super Mario World, Mario was actually punching Yoshi to get his tongue out. Considering the Mario series is frequent usage of abusing animals to achieve your objective, 
perspective. I can't say I'm surprised at all to find out this one was actually confirmed by a Nintendo designer. One that I find the most incredible that is the result of sheer determination from everyone involved who worked so hard to make it come true. The excruciating process that was the hunt for a final Easter egg hidden in the Shadow of the Colossus remake. With people theorizing that collecting 79 of the game's hidden coins would unveil something somewhere on the map. Shadow of the Colossus is a game that people have been theorizing for years, holds more secrets to find, considering it presents you with this seemingly endless open world, and yet really doesn't hide all that much in it. And all this time after the game's release, people are still hoping for even a hint that there really is that 17th Colossus out there. So when the PS4 version was announced, this desire to uncover something amazing was reignited all over again. It all started with the game's ending credits, which stated there was a special thanks to Nomad Colossus and the 79 Steps to Enlightenment, which is where our number comes from. Nomad Colossus, by the way, is a prevalent Shadow of the Colossus YouTuber focused entirely on tidbits and information about the game, so it's super cool they officially acknowledged his efforts, while also teasing one more hidden thing for him to find. Problem was with these coins was that they were literally in the middle of fucking nowhere, hidden somewhere in this big fuck off map with absolutely zero indication from the game as to where any of them were. I haven't put this much effort into anything in my life. Collecting said coins caused a locked door in the game's hub world to light up, a door that was also present in the original version but didn't actually do anything. In the PS4 remake, however, the door can be unlocked should you somehow have all these coins, which unveils a secret throne room containing the Sword of Dorman, a weapon that does slightly more damage. <laughs> and that was it. Needless to say, some people were uh, not so thrilled about this, but hey, that's still something. There is an excellent video by Jacob Geller that chronicles the events of the entire saga, which is absolutely worth the watch, even if you've never played this game. And that brings us to about all the fan theories I wanted to have a look at this time, even though I bet I've still missed like a thousand. You gotta give me a break, okay? I can only scroll through so many what culture articles. Thanks so much for watching as always, and I'll see you all next time.